Welcome back everyone to part B of my two-part chat with former Australian goalkeeper Bob Proctor. Now if you missed last episode, Bob took us inside what it took to make it to an Olympics in those days and spun some cracking yarns about what life was like on tour. In this part B, Bob recollects on his Olympic experience and how they came so close to clinching Australia's first ever Olympic gold. A brilliant coach in his own right, Bob then talks about his coaching philosophy and his take on what it takes to make a great team. Rip in. What was Europe, Europe like in the day? It seems like, I don't, I'm not sure, but it seems like the crowds back in, in those times were, were way bigger than what we get these days. Is that the Yeah, case well, the, really? the game, the, as we flew when we played at Limburg, and that was the first official Australian team to play on a, and an artificial surface. And mm. so we, we played them, and Merv Adams said to me, Paul Deering in, in 72, and I forget the short corner hitter, you should go out and slide at him. <coughs> and Merv, and um, uh, the Germans had um, Wolfgang Stroder, and he was the leading goal scorer. He sounds tough. Yeah, yeah. And he could thump a ball, and Merv Adams said to me, I want you to slide the first corner. Yeah, okay. And you can trap the ball inside the circle, right? In yeah, those yeah, days. yeah. You didn't have to wait for it to go back outside or anything like that. No, yeah, yeah. See, what ha- what, what used to happen is that the, the, the stick stopper would start from inside, f- inside right, mm-hmm. and the hand stopper would start from inside left, and they'd come in like a V, and they'd probably come in a metre and a half. Now, if a goalkeeper goes out two steps, which is about a metre and a bit, you're not hitting from 16 yards. You know, it gets a bit close. Mm. <laughs> So Merv said, I want you to run the first corner. I said, yeah, no worries, Merv. So I don't know where you, I had the boots I was wearing, the hard toe, they were ankle high, uh, and they had six studs on them, um, and they uh, uh, plastic. So you weren't in, you know, like your boot, the blacks play now with the ripple soles you've got. So I'm on the line, and Merv says to run, I'm going to run. You know, I'd run through a brick wall for the guy as mm. much as I thought of him. He said before he's a sensational human being. Anyway, so the push out's on and I've taken off. The trouble was I slipped <laughs> and I went, I am in dead step trouble here. Merv said, run, everyone suspect me, run. So I ran. And <clears throat> at this stage, I'm probably, you know, half a yard, if not more, from where I should have been. So I thought, I'm just going to hit the deck. So I, I got pretty close to him. And as I slid, my left pad went underneath and the ball hit me inside the left knee. The ball went out to the 25 sideline. Oh, Jesus, that hurt. <laughs> Made the save, feeling real good for myself. Got back in the net. And you know when you get hit, if it's like boom, boom. Mm. I'm starting to feel, oh, I'm starting to feel sore and I'm rubbing it. Anyway, made a couple of saves. And, Half time comes. I get off and bloody knees. And then I take, looked inside my knee and you could just see it. Just. So when I went back in the second half and uh, it was stiffening up. So it came off and uh, we didn't have a doctor with us. We just had a manager. 16 players, a manager and a coach. That was it. Mm. No barbecue team, you know. If you wanted a barbecue, you had to cook it yourself. Anyway, so we got back to the rooms and. I oh, so went and saw the Keith moment went and saw the, the Germans had a doctor so that they're remembering ice is the big thing these days I was, he puts this white stuff white stuff on it and it was burnt then wrapped it up it was like denker rub mm. it was burning like all crazy mm. and it was so anyway I went back and I took it off and it was just blowing up and then we went to went to Holland played in Holland I didn't play I was injured um, then we went to England and played England. Um, at Lords? Was that the one you played at Lords? No, nah, that was on the way to the World Cup in 78. Gotcha. And um, so we played at the, Ma- I think the hockey, there might be a hockey field still there, the Match- Matchbox Company. It was an artificial, but it was like, the field was like carpet had been down for 400 years. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So I never played that one. And anyway, I went to, it just wasn't getting any, be- any better. So I had to go to um, myself and... Um, one of the other boys, I can't think of it was, made his appointment to go to the hospital to see this doctor. They'd lined up. So we get driven to the hospital, and of course their medical systems are a lot different than ours. 
and you've got to line up, wait your turn and stuff like that. Well, there were people, we just, we were told to the words, you know, it would be 15 minutes or so, so we just, we're, we're, we're sweet. So <clears throat> we're just there watching these people, and people like, they were being hung, held up by their family members or somebody, and as soon as they got to the desk, someone, some doctor would come and help them, but that, that, they could have died in the mm. line and no one was going to help them. And that, that was sort of a bit con confronting these people sort of suffering. So then I went there and and uh, the doctor says, you know, bruising and nothing was broken, etc., etc. Uh, so then we went into Montreal and I had to have a fitness test. As you know, once you're going, well, it's different now. Once In those days, once you went into the village, you got injured. It's the Olympic village. Yeah, yep. that's it. You can't replace. Yeah. So... I had to do a fitness test and we played Belgium in a practice game and they'd lined up uh, Wayne Green from Camp uh, from Queensland if I failed and uh, that was it. So I was determined I wasn't going to bloody <laughs> fail and thankfully I didn't, got into the village and uh, wonderful two weeks uh, except for the end result and uh, it, was, it was good and just the fact that you were mixing with other wasn't just like in the World Cup, it was just hockey people in, in, in this hotel. You had other people. I remember sitting in the table with Nita Komanechi, mm. who was about two foot nothing. Mm -hmm. um, conversations with her and some other people. It was, and it was friendly. You remember it was sort of after 72 disaster with those killings and that. So there was, it, there was a lot of, you know, is it going to happen again? Not, and the security was like unbelievable. Um, and as it turned out, everything was fine. It didn't, you know, there was no nastiness, in, you know, like it was in '72. And you know, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience. And we played some bloody good, good stuff. Mm. And we, we were young, and, and we played India in the second guard. We played. Um, uh, forget it. I can't remember the first one. The second one, I didn't didn't get in the team and Merv, had, Merv Adams was a bloke always played his number one team mm. you know it's, and there was no interchange then I mean you had two reserves once you're off you're off so and you're going to make two changes so I didn't get picked so I knew I wasn't getting a dick and dig unless Graham where he got injured and I, and I would go on so and because I trained so hard and this that and the thing I was really disappointed mm. and sort of after team meeting I wasn't feeling sorry for myself because you got to realise you're 16, you're not, not everyone played. So I sort of went out and sort of, you know, if I get a chance, I'm going to bloody make sure. Went for a half hour walk or something. And I think I might have went, I think I went to the cannon and had a cup of coffee and went back and just clear my mind. And and when that was, we, we won the first game and the second game we played Canada and I got picked in that. And I thought, oh, well, Merv might be playing one against the other. So he's. So Anyway, I made made some saves against Canada and uh, got picked, and we played India the next game, uh, the reigning world champions. And in the dressing shed, Merv, I uh, saw so, uh, Keith Merton right up on the board, three one win, and we've gone, you know, went out and uh, half time we're three one up. This is against the world champions. What were we ranked at the time? Uh, well, I, I'm, we never made the World Cup semi-final, so we were probably six or seven, somewhere mm. down around there. Um, certainly the top four, so you, you had uh, the Dutch, Pakistan, um, so probably about six, fifth or six. Yeah. And uh, so he crosses out 3-1, puts 6-1. <laughs> so we go out there, final score 6-1. We absolutely... It was, it was probably the perfect game from us it was um, do you know why um, we'd been together for, for a little while remember you only got together when you got on the plane or, or went somewhere and you know Merv Merv made you want to play mm. Merv, Merv wasn't tactically you know didn't give you a lot of tactics he just went out there and you know you can save the ball save the ball mm. you know you and he, he spoke to people in the vision, so I don't know what he told told other people, but certainly there was no um, great game plan or game plan as such. A little bit, whatever. Not like these days when mm. you didn't have videos in those days, <laughs> which probably you guys would probably like. Um, so, 
so I think it was just a game that we just got a got a taste of it. The fact we were three one at half time and didn't want to take our foot off the the throttle. And again, you know, after after that, um, there was rumours and paper talk that the Indian houses were being burnt down. They'd been disgraced. They'd this that now. I think it was massive in India, massive. Um, and then we had to play Argentina, and win that we're in the semis and we lost. And I remember we were at um, the next day we were in the canteen, and um, Holland, uh, Glenn Holland, he was a 1500 gold medal certainty, and obviously didn't know who we were. And he was on the table saying, "Ah, oh, see the Australian hockey team lost bad luck. He'd take the piss out of us." And uh, we we didn't need the piss taken out because we we're pretty pissed off ourselves. So we we then had to play India for the right to play in the semi-finals. We end up on the same points and everything. So and it was just another, an extra match they made you play, yep, was it? Yep. Really? And wow. in the other pool, because Kenya didn't go, they had a, they had two games less, right? Because they, they only had um, five, we had six and whatever. So they, Weird. Yeah, so we then had to play India to get in again, and we knew it was going to be bloody tough. And it it was. We played 107 and a half minutes. I think that's five lots of extra time and a penalty shootout. And uh, um, it was a bloody. It was a. It was either you win or you gonski. Mm. And uh, we were fortunate enough. We won the penalty shootout. So. Do you remember? Did you go well? Well, the first four. I knew where they were. I picked. I picked the four of them. The first four. Oh, it's just that split second I touched I know I touched one I may have got two but I was peeved off that I, I didn't get it because I, I did pick which way they were going I mean you got two you got four choices you know mm. was, I, no, I picked it but I just didn't get there the fifth one I was just there and I'm th- all I could I'm still I like, saved this I had no idea where he was going he went my bottom left and I stuck my foot out and saved it <laughs> And to this day, it was just total reflex because mm. I had no idea where he was going. I didn't wasn't try and pick it. I didn't just... try. I, I, and then Charlie and I've got a great photo downstairs of Charlie scoring it, and we, we Charlie going up hugging the hugging the uh, umpire, who in the final missed a penalty stroke should have gave, given us. So uh, Charlie might want to take that hug back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then and then we uh, played um, uh, Holland in the in the final. Uh, semi-final won that and then uh, disaster played against New Zealand mm. uh, I've seen the game once and we did not play well mm. lethargic um, and uh, you know uh, you never make excuses but you know the, the draining of that second semi-final uh, sorry the, the the replay and probably play next to the game and um, yeah, you know when you're, you're going in, we went in by bus, and we had some other a- athletes on the bus, and you know some of them were talking, and I'm pretty sure that wasn't the best. Mm. And I don't know whether whether they were just allowed on or who to in the zoo or what happened, because you know years ago, I mean we went to the rowing, um, but I thought in a in a uh, gold medal playoff, the last thing, and I had a rower next to me, and lovely, but I can't remember his name. And he just wanted to talk, mm. and I'm just trying to concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> I should have just said, "Will you keep your effing mouth shut?" <laughs> yeah. So we were. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it once, um, and uh, I've got to say, it wasn't pretty. Mm. And I've spoken to a few of the boys since then, and we all agree we weren't we weren't at our best. And um, New Zealand were very very good. They were, they had a really good game plan. They just kept belting the ball down into the corners and bottoms and then and, um, and then they they missed a stroke, put it over the top. And then the dreaded short corner between myself and um, Jimmy Irvine hit the top of the backboard and one nil down. That was uh, a good shot, though. Yeah, it was. It's, uh, what are the what do they say? The corridor of uncertainty. Mm. Um, and that was that was that one. And and then in this and what what used to happen? Uh, we start Jimmy Irvine and Wally Hemmett at fullbacks, and Ian Cook would come in. And remember, you only allowed two replacements and um, what had happened is that Ron Riley only lasted 
bugger all minutes, 10 minutes. No one knew he had a, a calf or a thigh, I think it was thigh. No one knew about it except mm. the management. Mm. And in hindsight, which is always a great thing, should not have played. So our, f- our first um, replacement was used up bloody quickly. And the, 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 the idea was, you know, we're in front, they're going to bring Steve Marshall, who had not had a game. And it wasn't until the final that you, they were told that if you don't play, you don't get a, a medal. Mm. So Marshall's sitting there, we're 1-0 down, and Cookie always come on if we needed a goal at the back end of the game because he was our number one short corner hitter. So Steve Marshall was like Gonski and didn't get on the field at all. Um, so Cookie came on and had a cor- corner. We hit the bloke on the foot. Uh, should have been a stroke, mm. and it wasn't. Mm. Uh, and the rest of the history. Their goalkeeper, Cookie, broke the goalkeeper's kneecap. In that uh, game? In that game, yeah. Um, he kept playing? He kept playing. He had a wonderful game. Um, yeah, so the worst thing out of that is Steve never got to get a medal. Mm. But my understanding, um, Herbie Haig uh, gave him his medal because he'd had one from uh, 86, uh, uh, 68. Mm. So it was a bit, bit sad for Steve. Yeah. Um, but had you known the rule, had we known the rule at the start of the tournament, things would have been completely different. And it was only, I, I remember, um, because Merv always played his you know, top team or what he thought was his top team. Um, Herbie paid cap- captain plus left half. Well, Barry Dancer was left half. Mm. And Herb was sick one, one match. So Barry played. And I always wonder um, if if Herbie didn't get um, injured, uh, uh, sick, would have Barry got on the field too? Mm. Uh, maybe he would have, but I, 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 I don't know. So... Um, yeah, so as I said, it was a bit disappointing for Steve. All the hard work not to get not to get on the fool, but more so not to get his medal. But yeah, you know, Herbie being the great man that he is, uh, made sure he did so. And then we, and and, and that was it. We we're all disappointed. Mm. Um, I've seen some I've seen some footage of it actually. There's mm. a three minute video. Couldn't yeah. find much, but there is a three minute yeah. video. I actually heard about that game a long time before I ever met you because yeah. my old man. A Kiwi, his yeah. science teacher is Barry Maester or Barry Yeah, yeah, Meister, yeah, 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 he played. Yeah. Um, who played in yeah. the game. So yeah. I, I grew up learning about the, yeah, the yeah. Kiwi gold medal. Yeah. But hearing about the other side, it, it looked a lot like you guys, in the three minutes that were, the last minute seemed like absolute mayhem. Mm. Like it was just, you were you were nowhere, obviously, yeah. because all the, everything was down the yeah. New Zealand end yeah. and it was just yeah. madness. Yeah, yeah. And and the thing about it, you, you so far, the, the, the joint was, it's, it was at a university, the, the, the field, and it was, it was like a bit of a coliseum, a big wall at the back and whatever. It was quite a nice place to play hockey. And the grandstands were chocolates. I mean, it was uh, any final of the Olympics, people come out of the woodwork. So it was a great atmosphere, and, and, and uh, you know, they played bloody well. They were they tactically out outdid us. Um, and so we, were, we were sluggish, and if you... The only reason I got a game is that Ron Riley's daughter worked with Channel Seven, and she'd never seen him, seen it. And they were they were there, so Ron got a thin cut cut of it and gave me one, and I've and I've watched it. And as I said, it was it, it wasn't our finest moment. We didn't mm. play well. They mm. played extremely well, and um, you know it's, they missed a stroke. I don't think we had too many chances. Um, had Ron Ron play because he he uh, he was on fire in the tournament. Uh, may have made a difference, but ifs and buts of this world, you mm. take the good with the bad. So, mm. Mm. and then yeah, and th- so that was it. And then uh, the next trip was to Argentina for the World Cup, and that's where we played at Lords. Um, walking through that, you know, the the long room, wonderful. I remember, <laughs> I remember, uh, we were warm up. We played England. We played Scotland on the following day, and I played against England. And Rowan Dick and I always had to go to the toilet for a game. And uh, when you're in the middle of Lord's Oval, I'll probably get fined for this. <laughs> in the middle of Lord's Oval, um, there aren't too many toilets. <laughs> so Rowan Dick and I down on one knee <laughs> and did the job. And 
think I'm the only person who's ever pissed at Lords <laughs> <laughs> or on Lords because it's a long way away. Like the yeah. hockey field, presumably in the middle of the pitch, and it's a long way to get. <laughs> it's a long way to get. There. Oh yeah, so I didn't have time to run off and, uh, and 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 do the job, and then we flew down to to Buenos Aires, um, which was a nightmare of flight. Oh really? It's like being in a sardine can. I feel like it's a long way to go from Australia yeah. to London to. Yeah, they just went to have some, pra- some yeah, practice yeah. games. And uh, so there we went down there, um, played in the tournament, um, got beaten in the semi final by the Dutch, uh, and won the bronze. Mm. So it was, it, it was a different place altogether. We were told not to go out in the streets. You know, mm. if you go in the streets, go out in groups. And one, excuse me, one night, where you, some of you sitting around next minute, the army have come in with, I think there's about four or five of the boys had got off the main drag and gone down the back streets and it wasn't looking pretty for them. They came back, do not go out in the streets. So, uh, yeah, so that was a that was played on grass. So, I mean, it, you, you played on turf in the Olympics and go back and play on grass. That's, a, that's not many people would play around that era where, like, so, so the first time, do you remember the first time you ever played on turf? Yeah, at Limburg in Germany. That was the first yeah. time ever. That, yeah. And same as for any of you guys, there was no turf pitches in Australia? Um, no. Did people change the... Like, I can imagine that's a massive performance advantage for people who are used to playing on turf. Well, you look at the European time. sides that played on. I mean, New Zealand were the same. I don't know when their first turf went down. I mean, the first turf in Australia was in Perth. Mm. And, you know, it was my last tournament in 79, so it certainly wasn't there in 76. Mm. And I know it was because you played it. You played it. You played it. Um, um, the Wacker. Mm. Um, so that's where their main main drag was. I mean, it had strange championships, so they were called in those days. You, over there, you played at the Wacker. Uh, most games. Um, so we'd had an experienced. I think a couple of bo- bo- boys who went on those um, Perth. What's that club called? Um, Wasps or no, no. There's a, a, a used to take young kids on trips and that they'd been to Europe. It'll come to me later. Um, they'd actually played on some turf. I'm pretty sure Dibsy had and cut a few of those other guys that in these um, been to Europe and played there. So yeah, it was it was different. But let me tell you, it wasn't hard to adapt. I it mean, wasn't. Well, the ball's on the ground, isn't it? Rather than bouncing around like a like a yo-yo. So. Mm. Um, I, I, I do laugh at people used to say how different it was. I mean, the ball's on the ground for Christ's sake. You know, yeah. you're not, and and you know, if it's rain and well, you look at the fields as you said you come past here, they'll be lucky to play on the mm. weekend because they're, they're flood and the council around here are pretty, pretty tough on those things. But you know, we played Saturday night and it was raining. It wasn't heavy, but it was raining, um, and you know, so I never found it was. I found it magnificent. Mm. Yeah, you know, my pads were always clean, and you know, mm. <laughs> so well, I thought it was great. <laughs> That's classic. And you, you retired in, or you, you left the Australian team in, in '79. Can you tell me about that? Uh, 70, 79, we played that standard tournament, um, and <clears throat> pardon me, I went out. I worked with some people in the bank, ANZ Bank at Bondi Junction, and they were living over there, and they ring me up, and said you come over for tea and I went oh yeah and I, I went over there and I, I'd, I'd been off the, I hadn't drunk for six months and you know well, it might have been six months at least three months three or four months <laughs> <laughs> it was a while and and um, so I went over there and I don't eat sweets very very rarely I eat sweets and had a lovely meal and Kathy was her name Kathy and John and she'd made a um, an apple pie and she said and I was chocolates. I was full. And I said, oh, no, I don't eat sweets. Well, it kept on nice. You know, so reluctantly, I said, yeah, okay. So big ice cream. I didn't want to be bloody disrespectful, which I should have been in the end. And I was tra- staying in the room with Trevor Smith. And I got home and got on the bed and my tummy's rumbling. I had no, nothing to drink, right, except tea or coffee or whatever. Mm. And I was up all night chucking. I was sick as a dog. So I went and told management, I said, oh, I'm a crook. I said, I haven't been drinking. I said, I'm just a crook. I mm. told them the story. So I said, go for a run and see you. I went for a run and I was knackered. Mm. I came back and I didn't play. And um, pardon me, then we made the semi-final and it was against um, the Dutch. And Wayne Green 
Wayne Green got picked in front of me. And anyway, everyone thinks it was me. God, he, he went across to make a save and smashed his teeth. <laughs> Broke his teeth. So, and we're playing Teach Cruz. And so I've gone on, no, warm up about two touches. And Teach Cruz is hitting the short corners. Anyway, I saved it and we ended up, ended up winning the game and then played against Pakistan side. It hadn't been beaten, I think, for about five years. Mm. And there were some sensational plays. The Pakistani team? Oh, yeah, they were red hot. Okay. And, uh, you know, we, we were playing and they, they were on an, another level to us. And uh, we lost 4-2. And I've got to say that I, I thought I had a, a bloody ripper of a game. Because mm. I, I was told by St. Peter Lieber Merv Adams said, you know, you'll be right. You said that was a great game. It was probably one of one of my better games, mm. and that was in my hockey career. Mm. <laughs> so obviously someone didn't didn't like. I, I got picked in the eighty squad, mm. um, but of course didn't go to hockey. Didn't go to to Moscow. Um, so yeah, that was that was my last tournament, and mm. then I continued to play for New South Wales till eighty four uh, for thirteen years, and loved every minute. Of it. I I must say we we. we didn't have the teams I think I've said to you guys before that you guys have had mm. we had some couple of years where we were we were pretty bloody good but overall we probably give ourselves a maybe a six and a half plus over all the years but then we had a couple of eights and 83 we let in we let in about bugger all goals like five goals for the rounds but we only scored six and we played the West in the finals and I'd, I'd actually broken my th- thumb at Union, Union New South Wales that I was playing for the Thursday night before that Friday. And I didn't tell anyone. And uh, so we got over there and Doc Sundon, I said, Doc, I think I've got a problem. Because I'd been a trainer and I couldn't stop. With the, if it hit my hand, I was like, it was just in mm. trouble. So he sent me off to then a stra- the Australian doctor. Got x-rayed and I'd broken the top part of my thumb. So I had to get noodled up. Every, before every game and you wouldn't believe the whole tournament I never had to make a save on it with my left, left hand <laughs> the whole game except in the final and Terry Lease has come down the left wing and snotted it bang and it was going into the uh, top left and I put my hand up and it's hit the thumb went over the top and I keep saying to myself thank God I didn't have to have any, any saves in, on the left hand so Jeez. yeah so um, yeah I, look I, I was happy I mean I'm obviously would have liked to kept going but as it turned out um, I ended up getting a rule job in 81 uh, with the proviso I didn't 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 go and in 83 that last year you had to put your name down to be considered for the Australian side and I said no I'm Merv Goodrich said you know you've got to put your name down I said no I've got a job now I said I'm not that's it so then I've had 38 years of selling grog so <laughs> Our hero of hockey for this week is Jack Rowe. Thank you very much to Peter Rowe for the nomination. Now, we don't have a lot of information about Jack, but by all the reports, he's a great teammate and mentor to younger players within the club. What we do know is that he's submitted three separate heroes of hockey and has alerted us to some great things people are doing around the club scene of Wollongong, and we like that here at the help side. So well done, Jack. You're in the running to receive a Voodoo prize pack valued at up to 600 Aussie dollars. For the rest of you, remember it's not too late to nominate your hero of hockey. And if you know someone who deserves some recognition for their contribution to club hockey, please don't hesitate to get in touch and get your hero in the running to win the Voodoo prize pack. Plus, just for nominating, you'll instantly get a $100 voucher to be spent on a fresh Voodoo hockey stick. Check out our socials for details. Now, back to Bob. After your career, you... um probably especially in recent years most well known as a, as a coach and you've coached a lot of teams mm. um, very prominent figure around Sydney hockey very successful coach perhaps the most successful Sydney first grade coach um, coaching Moorbank Sutherland St George um, and also through juniors I'm interested in your in your coaching philosophy I guess well I said a bit earlier I mean Ken Walk Senior and Merv Adams uh, very influential in in my um, thoughts about hockey, about hard work, 
and you've heard this probably how many times I'm, I'm a trenches man uh, you're in the trenches with your mates and someone's coming over the hill with with guns and you've got rocks who's going to stay with you I'm going to look at those sort of things um, I, I know when I took the junior to start back there my, my theory my theory was to teach the kids what hockey was about not just hit and giggle um, and hard work I think the first couple of training sessions I made you do some <laughs> do some stuff you may not have been used to at that age um, and I remember when uh, I took up New South Wales coaching it was the 21s I was still playing for New South Wales seniors and the reason I did it was that there were some good players that in my opinion they weren't being taught what hockey was about at the next level so when I put my application in one of the things I said is that these kids have been taught hockey but have they been taught to get to the next level so when anyway, I got the gig um, I had two, four, two, four year appointment two and two and uh, so 78 we played and uh, that's the first year the AIS was and Kenny Walk and Birmingham they went over there they were in the team with some other good players we got beaten in the semis following year uh, Charlie was a WA coach and we were playing the playing a game we only had to draw it and we were drawing it and a particular player just who who was renowned for being selfish had the ball on his stick with about 10 seconds to go and instead of just hitting him down the line he tried to beat um, Peter Hazelhurst well Hazel said thanks very much to score with the goal we had to lost in extra time and then 80 um, it, it it was a shocking team uh, shock. got beat 12 nil one day by South Australia it was a shock I couldn't teach these kids to drink water mm. um, that's truthful I'm not being disrespectful but they, it was terrible <laughs> and so I, 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 I did that and then I, after I retired 84 I got 85 86 appointed and I I picked some guys in the 85 side that in hindsight I shouldn't I, I thought the year before they they just in my opinion, just weren't given the opportunity. So, and I was wrong. <laughs> um, and then uh, we missed the semis. They went from playing uh, um, on turf in Canberra, played my, played my last game in turf, went down and played on grass down in Hobart. And we were in the semi finals with about a minute to go because Victoria had to lose and they snotted one with like. 10 seconds, ridiculous. So that we never made the semis, and then we went to Darwin in, in um, the following year, and I just completely picked all young blokes, um, just got rid of all the old blokes, and that was the start of some really good hockey careers. Um, and you know, Kenny Walk, Yorkie, Dero play for Australia, Des King, Gary Jennison, Benneman, Fitzy. Um, I'm sure I've missed I've missed a couple, um, and they were they were a bloody good bunch of kids, and they were they were willing to learn, and I flogged them, um, and you know we, we had some fun, and one of the stories up there was that we stayed in the same place as uh, Queensland, and Greg Browning was their coach, and I was work, working the twoies at the state, and I knew the bloke who was running the Northern Territory and I rang him up and I said mate I'm coming up a couple of weeks can you get some grog for us I said yeah no worries <laughs> so I talked to Greg Brown and he said, I said you want me to get some grog he said yeah 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 so I rang the bloke up I said right I'll get you this so they got their four X and four X light which I was selling we got two is for 2.2 and two is new now the thing the thing was I said to the players yeah you're allowed to have two cans of light or one can of full strength each night, and that's it, no more. And I'm going to make sure, etc., etc. Yeah, right. And I remember Kenny walks home and said, "Well, I won't be drinking that stuff. I'm having a full one. No worries, Kenny. As long as only one." So anyway, lady comes, uh, like, knocks on the door and said, "Mate, I've got the grog for you. I've gone out to sit this truck. There's a pallet of beer for two teams." I bring Greg Brand, hey, Sundays, come and get your grog. He's come down and gone, Jesus. I said, well, don't have to drink it, you know. <laughs> so it came and we'd made the semi-finals with a game to go. And that hadn't been done 
done for a while. You know, we were sitting pretty. And so we're watching the replay. We had videos in those days. And uh, we're watching the video. We're going, hey, oh, good shit, blah, blah. So I've gone to bed. Colin Allies was the manager. And he said, uh, we've been kicked out. I said, who's stuffed up? He said, you. So what are you talking <laughs> about me? What have I done? He said, you know, we're watching the video and you're going, yahoo, yahoo. I said, well, I wasn't the only one. He said, but you were the only one <laughs> louder than anybody else. She was an old, you know what? She was just, she was terrible. Anything, sneeze, you know. You got kicked out of the hotel for being yeah. too loud. Yeah. Jeez. Right. So then we had to find accommodation. Jeez. So we told the blokes and they're going, like, we're in the we're in the semis. We got. I think. Whoa, Jesus! I'm going to handle this. So anyway, Kyle and I found this place, and we'd gone from you know the old penthouse to the shit house, and uh, it wasn't quite that bad, but it wasn't. Good. It was like a dormitory type thing. And I think. Oh. So anyway, we played the last game and won. Played WA in the semi final, and we'd had probably Fitzy knows his exact number. I think we'd had about. 30 state caps and we had about 420 you know and uh we went out there we lost 2-1 and we we had some chances to score and when the boys um came back around as a group the grandstand stood up and and, and cheered them and clapped mm. them it was wonderful I, I still remember it and as i said they they ended then we uh the team i think the night we won the two changes 87 we played um WA in the in the final at Sydney here and I got no doubt had we had Kenny Walk who was injured and we had gave him a um a um fitness test in the morning and he was struggling and I said to him I said Kenny I don't care you're going on one leg you're going to play I said you're not going out like this and he went for it he said BP I, said, I just can't do it and I was really saddened saddened for that um so yeah had he played I think it might have been a different we only lost 2-1 and I remember Benners had a got the got the ball. And he had Craig Davies beat, and then the goalkeeper. And I knew if he got past Davies, it was in the back of the net. And he's taken Davies on his on his four stick. And <laughs> Davies says, "Thanks very much. See you later." <laughs> but, but they played. Uh, they played well, and then the fall, and they won for a couple of years after that. The New South Wales team. Yeah. Um, how did you How did you make like what made I, that I team? I I I I that was eighty seven and eighty eight. I had one more year to go. It was in Brisbane. And I was struggling, um, and I just we had they had a um, pre little tournament in Sydney. Uh, there was us Queensland, Victoria, and ACT I think it was, just a little round robin. And I was I was struggling to be motivated, and, and I I just so I was coaching Sutherland at the stage. I was, so I was coaching club, I was coaching state, mm. and. I just felt that uh, I, I couldn't do the j- job justice, so I pulled the pin and Doc Sundan. I gave it to Doc Sundan, and they went. They went to Brisbane, um, made the semis, and then the next two years they they, they won it. So I I just I was just struggling mentally, mm. um, certainly not physically, but mentally to to really do the job any any justice. So. Yeah, people said, "Do you regret?" It? And I don't think so because I don't don't think it would have been. And the funny thing about it, I, I was coaching Sutherland at the, at the time. I actually went up and watched them play, but it's different watching them play than mm. going through all the rigors. Mm. So, so yeah, that was that was it. And then I finished coaching Sutherland, and then had a couple of years off. And then Bankstown approached me to coach him. Mm. Um, then more Bank. Mm. I mean. One about Morbank's a good one because Kevin Flack and I never ever saw um, eye to eye on many things. And I was coaching Larry McIntosh, who was coaching state side in um, eighty, uh, sorry, ninety seven, and um, we we'd won it, but Flacky, uh, Mark Flack had to pull a pin, so he asked me what I do, so I went up and. And I, we coached it, and John Evers was the manager. Anyway, Warbank um, was struggling a little bit at that time. Anyway, he rang me up with your coach, Warbank. I was like, I'm too sure Flacky would like that. Anyway, catalog story. I spent seven wonderful years there. <laughs> one, 
six grand I've played six grand finals won five on a trot so I had a, had a good uh, had a good run there and I really enjoy the club they're they're, they're good and uh, now my boy's playing there mm. so I'm back there again so mm. but yeah so Bankstown Sullen mm. um, captain and coach uni we got a question about um, great teams. As I said, mm. you've got a good winning record, great winning mm. record, and you've been a part of a lot of great teams. How do you how do you build a great team? What does it look like? Well, you've got to you've got to you've got to pick the right people. I mean, one word I hate is culture. I mean, every man's dog talks about culture. You know, it doesn't fit our culture. It doesn't. I mean, cultures are cultures about what that person is going to give you as an individual within a team organisation if, if they want to use the word culture then use that word but it's just in my opinion it's overrated every every um, uh, uh, rugby league team's got culture all of them but they're not all up the top of the top of the leaderboard you know you need you need the players that are going to go that extra mile for you the, 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 the ones that are going to dig deep you know I mean you look at look at Kurt Oakleby I mean You'd, you'd put your life on him, you know, and I just use him as an example. You know, he's, he's um, at the back end of his career, really. I mean, he's early 30s, but, geez, I tell you what, he make my team more, more times than not. Um, Tristan White. Um, you know, they're, they're people that you know you're going to get that extra extra out of them. Um, and I only mentioned those two. I could mention a lot. Kenny Walk. I mean, I... Two of the two of the best people I've ever trained, and you've taken the whole concept. Not played the best two people I've trained and worked with is Ken Walk and Brent Livermore. And I asked when we were over in Perth that last time. Uh, I spoke to Richard Agus. We often we could get a talk, and I, I said to him, I said, "Who's the two best trainers, play, the player and players you've ever worked with?" And he said, oh, he mentioned a couple of names, and he said Kenny Walk and Mark Hager. He said, um, "We knew what Kenny Walk's like. He, he was just he's sublime." He's, Tell us what, like, what. Oh, mate, he's he off the field at church mounts on the field. He, the Pakistan, the Pakistanis hated him because he just terrorised him, hit him, just terrorised him. I mean, he. You talk. I talk about the trenches. He is the trench. Um, you knew. That Kenny would not take a backward step. You knew Kenny was going to deliver every time, with or without the ball. Um, I saw him put young Jason um, from Sutherland, Jason, his father's present, uh, in a brick wall in a Glebe Sutherland grand final one day. The kid was 17. Just put him in the brick wall. Um, but that's what Kenny was like. You you just knew what you're going to get. Very rarely missed a tackle. Uh, and, and players feared him um, and, and as uh, Richard said about Mark Hager he, he just improved out of sight just worked and worked and worked and worked and just got better and better and better and just worked harder and harder and harder you know you know, I've got a theory that you know if as they say if you're a dickhead or you're causing trouble get him out of the joint I mean it's, sometimes it's difficult at club level you know it is difficult at club level um, but when you're getting a representative circle you, you've got them you know you either do it my way or the highway mm. and if you look at you know you look at me I've had to I've had to discipline um, some players I've left players out of games um, because you know I mean Mark Harris and Mick we played the, we, you know we played weekends away we played we played down in Wollongong on the Saturday on the Friday night and then on the Sunday we played South Australia that weren't the, weren't the hottest. Anyway, and we got beat. Terrible. And uh, the manager, Dave Gill, came up and he said, do you know that Harris and McCann played club hockey yesterday? What are we talking about? So they're in the shed, so I called them out and I said, you did play, play hockey yesterday? Yeah. Why? Well, you didn't say we didn't have to. I said, you're kidding, aren't you? I said, you're a New South Wales team. And Mick said, oh, we were short. I said, well, it's not my problem. So I said, you're both suspended. So didn't play, and we had to play, we had to play the following week to make the semis. And ACT, they only had to win. If they won, they were in. And um, one of their players missed a stroke, and we got in. 
and McCann and Harris, two of them are better forwards, are sitting up on it was at home bush. Um, so I got through that one, and, and the other one was 2004, it was Harris again, and Hoax. And uh, we'd lost the semi final against WA with a thousand chances. Mick couldn't hit the side of a barn, he just had one of those days. And uh, not wasn't because he'd be lost, but mm. you know, we had chances. And anyway, there was a curfew. I said, 11 o'clock, that's it, curfew, don't come back rotten. So anyway, 11 o'clock comes, there's three players missing. Adam Commons, Mark Harris, and uh, Mick McCann. So I'm on the phone. And before I ring Commo, Commo's rung me. He'd been, the, he'd been out with the trots with his father, because you know, he's a trotting nut. He said, BP, I'm in, I'm in a taxi line, I'm waiting for a cab, I'm just around the con... Promise, I'm, I've been drinking. I said, right, come on. And I'm ringing Hoag's phone, no answer. They walk in at quarter to one. And so I suspended those. I suspended, uh, those two got suspended, uh, missed the game, um, because it wasn't about them. And, you know, some, I remember when I left Mick and um, um, Harrow out of that one, remember, Belly ring me up and said I was a bit harsh on the team. I said no, you're a team man or you're not a team man. So I've got, you know, I've got fairly um, disciplined re things that I want people to do. Um, and probably someone to tell me I'm the most undisciplined person in the world, but <laughs> that's another story. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I had a, a, a situation with Birmingham at '87. Everyone was supposed to come into camp on the Wednesday. And uh, uh, everyone knew the, the game plan. And he said, oh, I can't come. I think he was selling insurance over in the West at the time. He said, oh, I've got to work. I said, well, everybody else got to work. You've got to come back. Cut long story short, asked about three nines. He said, no, three nines. So I ran Richard Aggers up as the Australian. I rang Merv, Merv Goodridge up, president. And I said, Merv, and I said, we're just dropping more on Birmingham. Why, why, why? He was captain Australia at the time. And I told him the story. He said, you can't do that. And I said, well, I've done it. I said, you know, I can't let him not come back and the others have had to give up work. So probably half an hour later, Richard Agus rings here. VP! Yeah, Dodger, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had a conversation and I said, mate, one in, all in or all out. And he came back and played. Mm. So, mm. But those, I'm not saying it's right, but you can't, you can't let um, one thing stuff over it. If, if you've it's like cancer. Mm. If you're not treating me the same as somebody else, and I don't, I don't care whether you're Tom Craig or Harry Bloggs, you've got to be treated the same. And I, and, and I believe is that that then instills that into the whole team mm. that we're not putting prima donnas up there and um, you know getting preferential treatment because sometimes uh, you need those uh, lesser players, and I say lesser players compared to the the elite. They're the ones that win comp for you, mm. the whole team. So mm. yeah, so it's about and then you know making sure that and you've heard this before that they can trap, they can pass, they can support. And the new one is run when on, not run all the time. <laughs> so um, yeah, so what does that mean? Run when on, not run all the time. Well, you look at you look at. And I won't mention names. You know when they get the ball, they're going to take it on. Mm. <laughs> um, so you know so you got to mix it up so when I was teaching Ryan and when I was coaching stateside Ryan was on my back as a two year old and, and all he ever used to hear was trap pass and support mm. and you look at Ryan's early stage he used to trap it and pass it and pass it and pass it and pass it and you know support and whatever well, you know, the last few years, you know, it's now run when on. So if you trap it and pass it and support, I mean, they're three most important things, and run when it's on. So you get the ball and you've got some guy up your backside or around you, it's a time to give it and support to get it back, you know, give and go and, and that sort of stuff, but not go, like, all the time. Mm. Mm. Um, so it's, it's about understanding when to go. And it's like understanding, you know, do I throw that pass? I mean, we've got a couple of real good young kids playing with us now that we've picked up. And, you know, I'm teaching them the value of 
looking at at, the, at their age. I mean, the 15 and 16 value of throwing the first pass they see, mm. not looking at oh yeah, it's too easy. I'm going to look at another pass, and then suddenly, you know, that ain't there anymore. And then you so so once you start to to realise that that first pass is is the best pass because that can then lead to the next one. Mm. And uh, everything's simple in life. If you want to complicate it, I mean, they talk about Anthony Seaball at the Broncos at the moment. You know, if he keeps saying he's got a young side, well, they can play football. Otherwise, they wouldn't be playing first grade and getting paid what they're getting paid. So, you know, and you only read what's in the paper. And he seems to be very complicated with his coaching. I mean, there was an article yesterday about, you know, these young guys just want to get in and play football. Mm. And then you look at you look at Bellamy, I mean, and even at South, um, yeah, any anyway. Wayne Bennett. Uh, Wayne Bennett. I mean, you look at, you look at that. It's simple, you know. They've got players backing up, giving early ball. Mm. So sports not sports like like life, mate. It ain't complicated. Mm. If you want to make it complicated, it will get complicated. So, so mm. that's basically you know my thing on coaching. And as I say, if, if I've had the success as you said I have, and I'd like to think I have had success. Um, the game can't be too too hard to coach. Mm, mm. The one thing I've played a lot with Ryan, your son, and I've I've played a lot with you on the sidelines. And <laughs> one thing that can we rephrase <laughs> that? <laughs> <laughs> one thing, one thing that um that that really comes out is um, how much our success or Ryan's success means to you. I mean, in particular, watching the the Pride win in 2019, the New South Wales Pride after a long time, mm. um, and again in in Johor. I know sometimes I hope you don't mind me saying, but you get quite emotional after after some of these successes. Why is that? What does it mean to you to watch? Them? Well, you know, I remember Ryan was playing soccer. He was playing rugby league, and um, we were driving in the car one Sunday, and he turned around and said, um, "I want to play hockey." And I looked at Gail, and, and Gail looked at me, and sort of got out of the car. And where's he going to play? And because he'd been to some coaching, I said, "Since he's a two-year-old, on the back in one of those." carry bags and I used to pick it, pick the balls up and he'd, I'd have to forget sometimes he's in the thing and he'd start coming over the top of my head and <laughs> so he'd been involved and of course his mother was a bloody good hockey player and you know there's pictures of us down in the rumpus room etc and so he started to play and, and I said all right well and he hooked him up at Sutherland and I cut down a hockey stick for him and, and we went down there and taught him how to hold the ball and and, and whatever and then uh he was it was at the end of 13s he went to a Sydney trial and he was playing left wing and uh, anyway he he came back and his head you know you get named in the team in the yellow green team whatever team and he came over and his head was down and he said what's the matter mate he said oh they put me at inside left I said that's great mate he said but I've been playing left wing I said mate inside left I said just get it and give it that's all you got to do just get and he was getting and given I said to Gail I said Jesus, you know, and um, and I think it goes back to past past the bloody thing. So it it gave me great heart to see that he was a good pass for the ball because that's I just and that's what M- Merv Adams taught. You look at the people who he taught the Dibses and the Walshies and Charlies and that. You know, he was all about passing the ball, and uh, so that was the start of it. And of course, you know, he got picked in a couple of teams. That, first one was 15 standing in Hobart you guys won it and then you know he, he, he got into the 18s after the all schools trip to Europe that you, that you were on and you know he was I could see he was playing some good hockey and, and doing the things that I'd, I'd asked him to do yeah so he's given Gull and I a, 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 you know some wonderful moments trips and meeting good people from all around Australia I mean Paul Gerard now is one of my best friends you know and it wouldn't have happened had had, had we not gone to Joe Hall. Mm. Um, and then of course Joe Hall, uh, it's another level. I'd love those. I'd love. I'd love to go back every year. Mm. I just love Joe Hall. It's just a. That's an under twenty one national. Yeah. Tournament in, in yeah. Joe Hall. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and then of course the World Cup in India was, you know, was a good trip, and, and yeah, so, you know. And like your mum and dad, with you and Ben, and you know, you get a lot of pride in your kids doing well, and you know they're they're not out stealing cars. 
you know <laughs> you still love them even if they weren't doing well but you know it, mm. it uh, um, and you know he he's <coughs> pardon me he's enjoying it I mean now he's just finished his apprenticeship as a as a electrician uh, he's got a couple of little things to do yet but you know I'm really proud of him of that um, and overall he's a good kid I hope he doesn't hear that um, <laughs> you won't but, listen to this don't worry about yeah, that <laughs> but but um, yeah so it's given and Gal and I immense immense pleasure and you know I, I when I coached St George um, he was um, um and arm where he'd come with me um, and he did so he was in that team that which you played against which you know had some you know Hayes Gut, Govers um, Brook and, and some players that that were really young 16s and that um, playing against men and you know they they, they held their own uh, got a couple of floggings um, but you could see the improvement on, of them um, and then when what happened at St George happened uh, which was disappointing um, he went to Moorbank and, and sort of just got to that the, 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 those next levels of playing with some good players mm. um, and being able to express himself so yeah it, it's been good and of course you know you, you lead on to it, you know I'll say it I mean disappointed they didn't get picked in a couple of the New South Wales sides early on but I'd probably get sued if I went over that one um, <laughs> and and so you know we play with South Australia mm. play with ACT a couple of times and, and then rightly got picked in the in the, and I'll say rightly got picked in the New South Wales side um, then you got we got beaten up in Tassie and then of course last uh, up in Brisbane sorry um, and last year you know the pride it was I mean it was just wonderful following you guys around playing some good hockey and, and yeah I was emotional because you got to remember I played 13 years uh, as a player for New South Wales lost two finals and I you know more fifths and sixths and we came last in 73 so to see to see that um, it's good and you know Rick Charlesworth reckons New South Wales were chokers <laughs> so um, we were for a lot of a lot of times but you know you take you take the win when you can and uh, you know um, it was bloody good and the thing I got out of out about that is that I could not uh, put a finger on any player that never contributed and you know we there were some players that came in for one game a couple of games or whatever and out of, I don't know how many players we played what probably 17 maybe 18 something like that yeah, yeah. Um, so there wasn't one player that I would say didn't contribute towards that success and <clears throat> and of course you know coaching staff um, I mean Livers does like his meetings <laughs> <laughs> and obviously <laughs> obviously it, it, it does work at times so mm. yeah and yeah and I, I remember being down in that dressing room after the game I mean I was full of pride as though I'd, I'd won the bloody thing um, and I wasn't just happy for Ryan I was happy for I think I kissed everybody didn't I, <laughs> no, I remember I think I, think I remember so. kicked or hugged or, or whatever so. because you know we, we've, we've had uh, some bloody good teams in the past I mean I'll I look at that one in Darwin. I mean, you had eight Australian players in there. You know, the, the, mm. the one in Perth the following year. I mean, you know, um, the, the same same thing. And there were elements in both those sides that, and I think even in the Brisbane side, there were elements in there that needed to be fixed. Uh, in my opinion, uh, they were fixed, and you get you get the the chocolates. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, there's no use saying I went through undefeated, mm. and didn't, not playing the in the final. I mean. It, and when you look at it, um, you know, last last year uh, and this year, a, a marked difference in 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 um, in some aspects of the game, and and you got them right, and you got the re- you got the results that you deserved, mm. you know. And in, and and I mean, one player said there was just a bunch of young kids playing hockey. <laughs> that, that was from a young a young well, catching up, and yeah, you know, he's. We were just talking about it and he said it was just a bunch of young kids playing hockey and enjoying themselves and I think you know that that came out in the games it was awesome it was a good year we're going to wrap it up but yep. before we do that a few things I do at the end of every interview is a couple of quick questions yep. standard questions the first one is the best player you've ever played with now you mentioned Kenny Walk and mm. Brent Livermore as people that you've worked with but the best you've ever played with well I played with Kenny there you go yep. easy 
<laughs> Easy. I oh, look. Um, I, I've 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 played I've played with some of Australia's played with and against some of Australia's best hockey players: mm. Charlesworth, Bill Walsh, Trevor Smith, um, just to name a couple. Um, and um, and it's all right when you're playing with them. When you're playing against them and get smashed all the time, it's not it's not the best. But mm. in their own right. But as a competitor, as a as just he, he was just everything. He was everything that you wanted. And as a fullback, especially with a, um, being a goalkeeper, um, and you know he had a bloody good partner in Michael York. I mean, I wish in those thirteen years that I played, I had a York on a walk. Mm. in front of me it would have mm. been a lot easier and that's no disrespect to the other people but yeah look Kenny Walk you know I played with him a couple of times and he was dynamite and that's and that's when he was when he was young mm. best you've ever played against non-Australian oh, a couple of packies a couple of Indians I can't I can't pronounce their name mm. just skillful oh yeah yeah. I mean that packy side that packy side as I said went through undefeated Isla Din on the Isla Din on the right wing, Carly Malik or something on the left wing. Um, Rashid in its centre forward used to hit you before you, you know, hit you first and get the ball second. Um, and a good goalkeeper, tall bloke. Um, and probably probably the best player is a guy called Ajit Pal. Played centre half for India. And, <coughs> pardon me, he was just magical. And this is on grass. Um, and when we played in that um, draw to play off to get to the semis in Montreal he was just at the top of his game he mm. was untouchable so you know in, in the final against Pakistan in Kale in 75 in the World Cup it's the same thing he just like give him the ball I'll get you home and so he was, he'd probably probably be the the best I saw mm. final question building a good team as a mm. coach you've got one piece of advice that you can give to someone who's taking over charge of a of a team of a first grade club team What's what would I give of, the new coach or one piece of advice to give the new coach keep it simple <laughs> <laughs> that works on that note I reckon we'll leave it thanks for chatting no worries Giving thank you time. thanks brilliant. very much cheers no worries that's it for another episode of the help side Special thanks to my production team of David Moore and Tim Collier, plus countless others working behind the scenes to get this to you. You're the real MVPs. Again, if you're liking the show, please like, subscribe, you know the drill, and get in touch with us via our socials. We would love to hear from you. Anyway, that's all, folks. See you next week.